The following program is sponsored in part by the Hopkins Chamber of Commerce. Hello, I'm Tim Kilduff, and this is Business Matters. You recall that we started a series of uh, programs aimed at not only featuring uh, local businesses, hopping in businesses, but trying to delve a little deeper into what uh, makes the kind of work that people do exciting. Uh, and I think we've got uh, an interesting perspective on that today. We have Peter Lagoy from Lagoy Risk Management. Peter, nice to have you. Thanks. Nice to be here, Tim. We want to talk a little bit in, in, in sort of uh, maybe go backwards, talk a little bit about what you do at Lagoy Risk Management, and then drop back, talk about some of the projects you've been involved in, and, and then maybe sort of in reverse, how you got here, uh, and what's, what's really, what really drives you, what's exciting about your work. So maybe you can give us a little overview on, uh, on what Lagoy Risk Management uh, Analysis is all about. Okay, well, I started Lagoy Risk Analysis about 10 years ago, basically when I got laid off from a, from a larger company. And since that time, what I've concentrated on is doing primarily human health risk analysis or risk assessment, which is evaluating the potential for exposure to chemicals and the potential effects of those chemicals at hazardous waste sites. Um, more recently, probably in the last oh, eight years or so, I've also um, spent about half my time working for a company called Bay State Gas, which is obviously a gas company with offices in Westboro nearby here, but serving areas of western Massachusetts and southern and northern Massachusetts. Um, for the gas company, what I've worked on primarily is cleaning up the old manufactured gas plant sites. As you may know, um, Prior to natural gas showing up in our area in the 1950s, people used to get their gas for heating and lighting um, through the process of manufacturing gas, which was taking coal and converting it to gas. And as you can well imagine, if you start from a solid and go to something that's a gas, you end up with a lot of intermediaries. Um, some of those that more tarry material was used for roads, and that's what early roads were all made from old manufactured gas byproducts. Creosote that's used on railroad ties and on telephone poles, also a product of the, the gas process, the gas manufacturing process. And then some of the chemicals for used as intermediaries in, in other chemical processes, the benzene, the toluene, some of those starter chemicals, again, came from that process of converting coal to gas. As you might, Peter, is it fair to say that there's, there's no shortage of work for you? Um, there were, most old cities had a, had a gas plant. So there's a lot of gas plants around. And there were well over a thousand across the country. Um, a good number of them in New England, actually. The process primarily started out here. Um, and my part of that work is, as you can imagine, people weren't quite as careful about environmental issues back in the you know, 1850s and early 1900s. And a lot of this material ended up in the ground, in rivers, and in the groundwater. And my job is to work to manage cleanup of these sites. Um, if you look at your gas bill, you'll see at the bottom line item, there's a little line that says environmental. The cost of the cleanup for the gas works for cleaning up these gas works comes off that line item. So huh. all ratepayers pay for that cleanup in Massachusetts. Do you, you know, that's, a, that's an interesting point. I never realized that. Do, do you think, well, I, I would imagine most people don't understand that we, ratepayers, are contributing to that cleanup. Yep, that's true. Most people probably don't know that. It's a good system, I think, because there's no incentive on the part of the company to take shortcuts. So the cleanup is going to be done um, thoroughly, and therefore the ratepayers um, and the environment of the people who use the the area are pretty much insured of a of a good cleanup 
at that particular site. The other issue is, and the reason that the Public Utilities Commission allows this is that it's a fairness issue. These were, the residual material ended up as an environmental cost that was incurred 100 years ago before people knew that there were these problems. And essentially, today's ratepayers are paying for their parents and grandparents not having to pay for these cleanups back 50, 100 years ago. And pretty much it's a, that's a lack of knowledge back then. I mean, exactly. People didn't realize what, what uh, these kind of byproducts did for the, did for the environment. Are, are you working on specific projects in Massachusetts at this, at, at this moment? I'm working primarily on three sites, one in Taunton, um, right along the Taunton River, and then two, probably my more interesting sites, are one up in Northampton, Mass., basically in the center downtown. There's actually a building out there, the Roundhouse wow. Building, which is an old part of the gas works. Um, and we just, about a year ago, um, that had tenants in that building. The tenants had moved out. We leased the building, drilled some holes through the floor, and found essentially that they'd filled in this old gas holder which held gas but then also had some waste products in the bottom, the tar, well, they basically put some dirt on top of the tar and left it there. So we spent a good bit of time, a few months, cleaning the tar out of the bottom of that building, keeping the building intact because it's uh, on the list of national historical buildings. The building's registered? Yes. Yes. Wow. You know, again, no one, I, don't, I wouldn't have thought that North Andover would be a place where you'd have this kind of building or facility. So when, you, when, you, when you're brought in, what's the process like? How do you, how do you start with a place like North Andover? Um, Northampton. What we're brought in typically by the, the state, Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, we get a, a notice. Sometimes we'll initiate these, these cleanups on our own, but mostly we wait for a, an order from the state We'll start by going in and doing some initial investigation, which involves sampling the soil, sampling the groundwater, and also doing a lot of literature searching, going back through our old files to see what information we have about where these buildings were. As is typical for old manufacturing processes, people would add things on, um, and whether it was a tank to store materials or whether it was actually a a side building where they stored something or had some process, a lot of this material gets added on and it's, it's fairly hard to figure out where things go. In Northampton, we found what we think is a, essentially a tar separator buried about four feet below the parking lot out there, loaded with tarry, oily material. It wasn't on any plans. We had no idea it was there until we caught it with the edge of, a, of an excavator one day and then found that it was full of this stuff and that we had to get, clean it up and get it out of there. So wow. it's an interesting sort of archeological dig at the same time that you're doing um, cleanup of, of hazardous materials. So you're not, I, I think we could call you an environmentalist, but what about the technical aspects of what you do? How, what brought you to this line of work? What's your background? My background is um, I started Back in um, the early 80s, I was actually at Georgetown University down in Washington, D.C., and a friend of mine had gotten a job working as a library searcher at this company called Clement Associates, which was really the first company that started looking at the health effects of chemicals on, on people in sort of a systematic way. They were doing the, the first people doing what's, what's now called risk assessment, almost its own science. And he asked if I wanted to come over and, and work with him, and, and I did that for a while. And then um, what we would do as that process, as a library searcher while I was at school, was the scientists there who were collecting all the data, say, on a particular chemical. So all the studies that, it, that had been done looking at the health effects of that chemical. So there'd be studies on animal toxicity. There'd be studies done on workers and, and their exposure. They identify the studies that have been done, and there are online search um, strategies and search ways to do that, to s develop those searches. And then they'd give me a list of those articles, and I'd run off to Georgetown and George Washington and 
the Library of Congress and, and collect the articles and bring them back. Wow. And I, when I graduated, it was at the start of the Reagan years, and environmentalism wasn't exactly uh, high on his agenda, <laughs> shall we say, or it may have been high, but not <laughs> in a way that was going to encourage its development. And uh, I got offered a position by them to, to work as a scientist doing the, the same review, the initial review of articles. And so I started there. And I was with Clement for about seven years. They got bought by another company, ICF, and became ICF Clement. ICF is still in existence today, and Clement is still a little piece of it. And um, with them, you know, sort of moved up through the ranks as, as we do and actually transferred out to California with them. I had an opportunity to move out to the San Francisco Bay Area and, and took that, moved out there with them. Um, after being out there for about a year, again, doing, still continuing to, to do evaluations of the health effects of chemicals, but at that time the Superfund program had kicked in and Clement was doing the vast majority of the Superfund health risk assessments. So we'd, someone would get a site, someone else would get our prime contractor would go and do the investigation of all the, of that site. They'd look at the soil levels and then what was in the groundwater and they'd get this huge reams of data. They'd have hundreds of data points on hundreds of chemicals and then they'd bring that to us and say, okay, what do we do with this? And it was our job to sort of sift through it and decide what someone could be exposed to and how much of that chemical they could be exposed to. And then to determine from that and from information on the toxicity of the chemical whether or not that was a problem for people and therefore whether or not the site needed to be cleaned up and whether or not those particular chemicals needed to be cleaned up at that site. Well. In that process, it, as I mentioned, it was a very new field, so there was a lot of um, interesting things we could do. And papers that I published back then are still actually used today. One was, uh, my most famous paper is on soil ingestion by children. How much dirt do kids eat? And that was an interesting process of going through and looking at what studies had been done. And there were a couple of good studies, finally, that had been done examining how much dirt kids got on their hands, how many times they put their hands into their mouths, and, and basically how much dirt they got into their systems. Wow, you're the, you're the, the principal in that, res that level of research, that kind of research? Yep. It, interesting, yep. <laughs> interesting. It, it's got to be fascinating to go from the research part of your early sort of development and entry into the field. There's got to be a, sort of a great sense of accomplishment when you can actually be on the ground and affect the change years after uh, something dangerous has been entered in, has uh, been introduced to the environment. It's got to be it's got to be terrific, uh, an exciting kind of a, a, of option to be working in these cities and towns doing that. Yes, it it is certainly interesting. I mean, sometimes you're depending on where the battle's going. Sometimes you're trying to convince industry that they really need to clean something up. Other times you're trying to convince the public that something is perhaps not as dangerous as they think it is. Um, a, a lot of what we do is affecting public perception. And right. when, I, when I say public perception, it's not just the general public who shows up at a meeting and is concerned about a site. It's also affecting and, and sort of changing the mindset of, of corporate America at, at times. Is that, is that work easier now than it was, say, 10 years ago? Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the soil ingestion paper is actually a good uh, example of that. When I was first looking at it, my um, point was the, the numbers, the how much soil kids got seemed to be very high. And I talked to the person who did the initial studies, and she said, I came up with that number really back of the envelope. I was sitting in a meeting, and someone said, what? we need a soil ingestion number. And she said, I, I think it's too high, but I'm not sure. And so there were some studies, and I collected the studies and, and started looking through those. Meanwhile, some of the industrial folks were saying, kids don't eat dirt. That's just crazy. <laughs> so I'd wander around with my pictures of kids eating dirt, and you know, the 
pretty easy to find, as any parent knows. Kids right, right. eat dirt. They right. simply do. But industry didn't believe it. And so you'd, you'd throw a picture of a kid in a sandbox at them and you'd say, okay, tell me what that kid's doing. And all right, they're eating dirt. Wow. And so it's getting that, trying to get that scientific balance. How did you get from California to the, to the Northeast? Are you from here originally? I'm from Connecticut originally, oh, okay. northwest right. part of the state. I uh, went to Northwest Catholic down in West Hartford. Uh, so a New Englander at heart. A New Englander born and raised as a, as a New Englander. Yep. Is that what brought you back to this neck of the woods? It did. Um, been out in California for about seven years. And California is a wonderful place. And yeah. the climate and the food is, is amazing. And, you know, you, you meet people out there and they say, well, why would you live in the East Coast? It rains out there. It snows. It, you don't know what the weather's going to be from day to day. But my family's from back here, and, and when I had my first child, about a year after that, we ended up heading back east so that grandma and grandpa could yeah. spend more time yeah. and, and we could spend more time with them because family becomes, family's wonderful when you're two people with no kids, but as you get more kids, it becomes more critical. Let, let's talk a little bit about um, the, sort of now the, uh, uh, the kind of work that you do on a volunteer basis in the community, because I know you're involved in a couple of different projects. And I'm wondering how you, uh, you take this, again, this substantial research background, the work in the environment, and that how do you work that sort of um, background into your activities in the community? Um, well, when I first applied, uh, the first work that I did that was on a um, elected board was actually on the planning board back Oh, probably 95, something in that time frame. And one of, the, one of those lovely quotes that you get in the paper occasionally is that when being interviewed for the position, because I was taking over a, a seat that was being vacated, they asked me what my uh, skill level was that I would bring to that particular job. And I said, well, I have an analytical mind. And that was the only <laughs> thing that showed up in the paper. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. But I, I do think that's important, that ability to what I need to do in my work is to look at a lot of information and summarize that fairly quickly and, and make a decision based on that information. And in working on planning boards certainly and in other town um, positions requires that sort of ability to analyze a bunch of different information and come to a conclusion. It also requires you to, to reach out and to deal with different people's perception of a particular issue. As we all know, we've, we get into our own perceptions on a particular topic. People can have diametrically opposed right. views, and we need to work to some sort of solution. So I think my, my work, which requires that kind of evaluation and interaction, is useful in, in town government type work. Now let's talk about, I, I can't let you go without talking a little bit about downtown revitalization, which is, I know, an interest of yours. How do you, you've got, again, the, the, your professional and, uh, and educational background, you've had experience on the planning board, and now you're working on the downtown revitalization committee. If you had your way, uh, what, would, what would the ideal uh, outcome of the work of that committee be? Well, my ideal for downtown is something that's a little more vital than what we currently have. It, it'd be a destination place. It'd be, I live in the downtown area, and I have lived in downtowns both out in Berkeley, California, um, and in, obviously in the Georgetown, D.C. area. Um, and in Arlington, Virginia, there was an area called uh, Clarendon that I lived mm -hmm. in. And one of the nice things about those areas is that people would be walking around and there was activities during, at nighttime and, and during the day. And I'd like to see that in Hopkinton. And I think that's an option for us. Um, I like the rural character. I think we have a lot to offer with our lakes, with the wildlands. As you know, I, I love running on trails. And there's lots of miles of trails in Hopkinton to run on. But it's nice to have that center core to go down, get a good cup of coffee, um, get some sweets. I run in part so that I can eat <laughs> sweet things. And you know, I'd like to have those, that sort of destination 
in downtown. I mean, I think we've got a lot of the components in downtown. We've got the library, we've got the town hall. People are there for those reasons. We've got a coffee shop. Um, I think we could do a little better with some of the pastries, but that's a personal <laughs> choice. <laughs> By going out to Northampton, I could up the scale a little bit. I'll bet, I'll bet. Now, you're, you're, you mentioned trails. Uh, you're a runner, uh, living in Hopkinton. How many times have you uh, run a marathon, and have you run Boston? I've run probably close to a dozen marathons. I've run Boston a couple of times. Um, Boston's a tough marathon. But as you say, living in Hopkinton, you almost have to do it. I kind of laugh. I mean, I think someone could be the world record holder in the 10,000 and not run a marathon, and someone would come to Boston and someone would say, well, are you really a runner? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we revolve around Boston. Well, my, my hope is maybe we can, uh, we, we can identify some young, young and up-and-coming runner. My, my hope is that someday there'll be a winner of the Boston Marathon that was born and raised in Hopkinton. Uh, maybe it might come from your family. Um, well, my daughter runs, but... I don't know if marathoning is quite in her idea right now, <laughs> certainly. Do you see, do you see the, uh, the, the downtown uh, benefiting from the fact that the marathon's here, and, and how, how might you um, exploit that connection? Well, I, I think the downtown certainly benefits from the marathon being here. I think we could certainly do a lot more in terms of encouraging um, activities in downtown. As you know, people come from all over the world to Hopkinton for this marathon. We're known worldwide as a result of this marathon. And yet, if you go down on Marathon Weekend, you'll see runners, and a lot of runners, simply roaming around kind of looking for things to do. One of the things we're trying to do as downtown revitalization this year is give them something to do in the downtown area on that weekend. And we've got a, a few things we're looking at. Uh, we've talked to you about perhaps having an exhibit in one of the downtown buildings, whether it's the town hall basement. Um, we also were looking at having a race, but after talking with Tom Irvin, we may not be able to pull that off, but maybe we can do a pancake breakfast and again, encourage people to come into the downtown area. You know, it's interesting because some of those things that you mentioned uh, used, to, used to take place. The pancake breakfast for people who live in this community was a big deal at one point. We've shifted in the race and the mm -hmm. starting time has caused some changes there, but I hope we can bring some of, that, some of that back. Yeah, well, and again, on race day, one of the things we talked about in our last meeting was because the race now starts at 10, people are, the runners are out of town at 10.30 and people leave the downtown kind of looking for things to do. I know I personally, um, sometimes down at the Spanglers and I'll just go and sit and watch the race there, but oftentimes just go home and watch the race at home. And, and one of the nice things maybe is to have a place where people could gather in a group and set up a couple of large screen TVs and, and have people who want to watch, watch it there, maybe get some pizza, some other form of, of food, and, and work with some of the volunteer groups in town to, to help make something like that happen. Uh, I, th I think you're right. Uh, and, and do you f find yourself, do you get plugged into uh, the discussions around changing the light system in the center of town, those kinds of things? Is that part of the Part of, your, does part of your work in the downtown revitalization committee bring you into those kind of discussions? It does. We actually were involved in the, in the light, not so much with regard to the um, workings of it, that's certainly planning board, but we were involved with the aesthetics because ultimately we'd like to have different lights for the downtown area. Um, and I think everyone agrees that the power lines going through the center of town are not particularly beautiful. We'd like to get rid of them. We also, everyone agrees that right now, financially, it, it doesn't make sense. We can't afford to do that. However, when, as part of long range plans and perhaps as part of some of the infrastructure work that is supposedly part of the stimulus package, maybe some of that work can be done. And if you're going to dig up the road for other reasons, that's the time to be trying to bury the lines. And one of the things that downtown revitalization has been doing, working in conjunction with the planning board and, and um, 
other groups in town is trying to make sure that whenever one activity happens, other activities that should be associated with that happen at the same time. So that you don't dig up the highway or the roadway to put in deep piping, for example, and then two years later somebody else has an idea to, right. to bury the lines. You know what's fascinating to me is um, th th there are a number of people obviously that are committed to the community, but how a person's background, their skill sets, uh, bring them into uh, service for the community and then uh, allow that talent to be, to be used properly. I think one of the things that we've learned from uh, this discussion around business matters is that there are a number of talented people out there, uh, some of whom are engaged, some of whom, whom, whom aren't. And I think you're uh, an example of both skill set and talent but also, uh, I think it's a form of encouragement for the community uh, to, to think broader than the, the number of people that are in elected positions, but there, there's a whole host of talented people out there that I think we need, to, we need to work to bring into the process. So it's pretty evident through uh, the first few sections or first few programs of Business Matters that we do have a lot of talented people who live in Hopkinton. Peter Lagoy is an example. Uh, a scientist, a researcher, uh, someone who has uh, hands-on experience in working with serious environmental issues. Uh, and it's a number, another reason that we ought to be proud of the kind of people that, that provide service to our community. Thanks for listening. bad people, the gang members in the neighborhood. My brother, he wouldn't be happy at all if I was to tell him I was gonna drop out of school. He would not approve of that. Cause then that's gonna be two of us not handling our business. Me and my friends are close and we all believe in each other. I know they could graduate even if it takes them longer than the four years. We have classes together, so. We study together, we help each other at our homework. We realized we messed up in the past. I failed a couple classes before, not doing as much work as I should be doing. My two best friends, they keep me working hard. Anyone else? My name is David, and in eight years, I'll be an alcoholic. I do. I'll start drinking in middle school, just at parties. But my parents won't start talking to me about it till high school. And by then, I'll already be in some trouble. Kids who drink before age 15 are five times more likely to have alcohol problems when they're adults. The thing is, my parents won't even see it coming. So start talking Who's next? before they start drinking.